The operations presented in this video are meant to be instructional to ensure quality construction. This video is not intended to provide a comprehensive overview of safety procedures. All parties should ensure that they are familiar with and follow all safety requirements, policies, and procedures that apply to their specific operation. This video discusses the important activities required to successfully install and construct a precast reinforced concrete box culvert. Refer to Publication 408, Section 1085, and Appendix A of the Project Office Manual for the Quality Assurance Reporting System Checklist, COR 1085, for the construction and documentation of a precast reinforced concrete box culvert. For the purposes of this video, we will begin after the ENS controls and temporary water diversion system have been installed. At least two weeks prior to the actual installation of the box culvert, a pre-erection meeting is required to be held to discuss all aspects of the placement, such as delivery, staging, traffic control, sequence of erection, which would be included in the required erection plan, post-tensioning, grouting, waterproofing, and backfilling. This would also be a good time to conduct the pre-crane operation meeting, as required in Publication 408, Section 108.05c6. The first step to constructing a box culvert is the layout. The contractor surveyors arrive on site, locate the working points shown on the plans, and establish benchmarks. The work points and their corresponding northing and easting coordinates are shown on the bottom left of the sheet. The work points are used to establish the location and important features of the box culvert, while the benchmarks are used to establish the grade. At this point, it's a good idea to check the planned flow line elevation of the box culvert against the actual flow line of the stream channel to ensure the box culvert will not be set too high or too low. Typically, the flow line elevation of the box culvert will be approximately one foot lower than the actual flow line of the stream channel to allow for natural sedimentation to occur. If the plan elevations appear to be incorrect as shown here, the structure control engineer should be contacted immediately. Once the line and grade of the box culvert have been established, the excavation limits can be laid out. This will ensure that the equipment operator excavates enough material to provide the required amount of bedding material under the culvert, typically one foot on soil and two feet on bedrock. It will also ensure the excavation slopes are laid back far enough to provide a safe working area. The excavation should extend at least two feet beyond the edges of the culvert, up vertically no greater than three and a half feet, and then finally laid back on a one and a half to one slope. If the total excavation depth exceeds 12 feet, then the layback will start at the bottom of the excavation. The different classes of excavation are covered in the Road Construction Standards RC11. Provide as much advance notice as possible to the structure control engineer or the geotechnical section for scheduling a foundation inspection. The foundation must be sounded prior to placing any geotextile and bedding material. In certain circumstances or if soft material is encountered, additional depth excavation may be required. Typically, however, the excavation will be one or two feet below the bottom of the culvert. Once the bottom excavation has been completed, the tow walls or cutoff walls are excavated and constructed. The purpose of the cutoff walls is to contain and prevent scouring of the bedding material and to establish grade at the inlet and outlet ends of the structure. It's critical that the top and bottom elevations of the cutoff walls be constructed to plan elevations. The inspection staff should check these elevations to ensure they are correct. Any required changes should be documented on the as-built drawings. After the cutoff walls are constructed, the bedding material is placed. First, the contractor places a layer of Class 4 Type A geotextile material over the excavation. The contractor will typically use Ashto No. 8 material for the bedding. However, 2A material may also be used. The placement and grading of the bedding material is perhaps the most crucial aspect of placing a box culvert, since it's the foundation of the culvert. This is why the specifications require the use of a template for grading the bedding to provide uniform contact. The specifications also require the bedding to be within one quarter inch of the elevations shown on the plan. Note the use of boards to maintain proper elevation and slope. 
Irregularities in the surface of the bedding will cause the individual box culvert segments to set unevenly, which can make proper alignment of the joints in the remaining segments more difficult or impossible. With perfect bedding placement, the segments should align with ease. However, humps in the bedding can cause gaps in the top joints, whereas bellies in the bedding can cause gaps in the bottom joints. It's a good idea to pay special attention to getting the bedding as close as possible to avoid difficulties later on. Once the bedding has been graded to template and accepted by the inspection staff, it is important to protect it from damage. Workers and inspectors should be careful to not disturb the surface. Next, the contractor paints the edge lines of the culvert and places an offset string line to maintain the alignment of the individual segments. The most important line is the edge of the first box segment being set. Typically, boxes are installed from the downstream to upstream end, and the wing sections are installed after all of the box segments are post-tensioned, so it's critical to know the distance from the downstream cutoff wall to the end of the first box segment being installed. It's also important to discuss with the box technician the amount of lateral movement anticipated from post-tensioning operations, and factor that into setting the first segment. For phased construction where shoring is required to maintain traffic, the segments will be installed outward from the centerline shoring. Now it's time to start setting the box culvert segments following the erection plan. Ensure the segments will be arriving in the proper order to avoid a traffic jam at the job site. As the box culvert segments begin to arrive on site, inspect each segment carefully. Make sure to compare the segments to the shop drawings for identification markings and lifting devices. Inspect the gasket material for proper adhesion or any missing pieces, and ensure the tendon ducts are not obstructed. Look over the entire box for any spalls or cracks from shipping. If found, contact your structure control engineer. Box segments taller than 10 foot 6 inches will be shipped flat on the trailer and will need to be flipped when they arrive. Special precautions should be taken to ensure the segments are not damaged when laid on the ground. A good method to use is to set the segments on old tires. Reposition the straps to the top of the box. Place tires under the bottom edge of the box and then lift the top of the box to the upright position, which will crush the tires placed at the bottom. In this example, a crane with two lines was used to flip the segments into proper position. As the box culvert segments are picked off of the trucks and placed, be aware of your surroundings and always have an escape route to get out of the way. Never position yourself under the load or within pinch points and avoid standing in line with the boom of the crane. The box culvert segments are set using the offset lines previously placed. Extra care should be taken to set the first segment to the proper location and alignment. Once the first one is set, all of the remaining segments follow that same alignment. Sheet metal or masonite boards are placed under the joints to prevent the intrusion of bedding material into the joints. As the segments are being placed, all joints need to be snug fit before post-tensioning can be performed. This is typically accomplished by the use of chain come-alongs or hydraulics to pull the segments tight to one another. As this is being done, alignment and gasket fitting are checked. Post-tensioning tendons are pulled through the segments as they are set. Once all of the box segments are placed and the alignment is checked, post-tensioning begins. A copy of the jack calibration sheet should be obtained from the box culvert representative to ensure the jack has been calibrated within the last six months. Post-tensioning follows a sequence as described in the shop drawings. The post-tensioning sequence provides a numbering diagram to follow in order to have equal loading across the face of the box culvert. This is similar to using an alternating pattern to tighten the lug nuts on your vehicle. This process is repeated for the wing sections after they are set. Post-tensioning is done in three loadings. The first and second tensionings may be altered as required to maintain proper alignment of the culvert. All post-tensioning must be performed in the presence of an authorized representative of the department. As the post-tensioning is performed, make sure the sequence is followed. Check the gauge for proper loading and the joints for full contact of the gasket material around the entire perimeter. Even though failures of the tendon or chucks are rare, make sure you are not standing in line with the tendon being tensioned. After successfully completing the post-tensioning, the tendon ducts are filled with a Class C pre-packaged grout to fully encase and protect the tendons. 
This is accomplished by placing the supplied hardware into the ports of the tendon ducts and filling the ducts until grout comes out of the other ports. Make sure all the air has been purged to ensure that the tendon is fully encased with grout. The equipment is to be capable of grouting at a pressure of 100 psi. Look around the box and make sure that grout isn't leaking from any of the joints. If grouting is not performed on the same day as the post-tensioning, then within four hours of completing the post-tensioning, the tendons and grout ducts need to be protected from corrosion and debris by temporarily sealing all the ducts. Grouting needs to be completed within three days of the post-tensioning. If the three days is exceeded, the contractor will be required to demonstrate that the ducts are unobstructed. After all the ducts have been grouted, all hand holes, pockets, bolt sleeves, tie rod holes, and lifting lugs are grouted with a non-shrink grout. Another way that the tendons are protected is through the application of the waterproofing. The waterproofing also helps to protect the gaskets in the joints. Before placing the waterproofing, the exterior joints need to be checked to make sure that the difference across two adjacent box segments does not exceed one half inch. If the half inch difference is exceeded, the contractor will be required to submit a plan to the department to correct the exterior joint and ensure that the waterproofing membrane will have full support and contact across the joint after correction. The Bridge Construction Standards BC 788M Sheet 10 of 12 covers the typical waterproofing details for box culverts. The detail on the left describes the limits of the waterproofing membrane on the top surface and side joints. The detail on the right describes an occasionally forgotten one half inch layer of 4.75 millimeter wearing course material that is to be placed over the waterproofing membrane on top of the box as a protective cover. First, a primer is placed one foot on each side of the joint. The two foot wide waterproofing membrane will be centered over the joints on the sides of the box culvert joint. Next, the membrane is placed on the top of the box culvert from the low side to the high side, making sure the high side overlaps the lower. If the fill over the box is less than or equal to two feet, the entire top of the box will be covered with the membrane, overlapping the sides by six inches. If the fill over the box is greater than two feet, then only the joints on the top of the box will need to be covered with the membrane, overlapping the sides by six inches. Part of the waterproofing also includes the placement of a protective barrier to protect the membrane from being damaged during the placement of structure backfill. For the sides of the box, this will be a protective board as described in Publication 408, Section 680.2c. Typically, this is styrofoam with a thickness sufficient to protect the waterproofing membrane from damage during backfilling. As mentioned earlier, asphalt material is placed directly on the waterproofing membrane on the top of the box culvert. The asphalt is a mix with all fine aggregate, like a 4.75 mm mix. This asphalt layer is considered the protective cover. Before any backfilling of the structure can begin, a Class 4 Type A geotextile material will be placed as a barrier between the backfill and the excavation. Be sure to refer to your plans for any details on the structure backfill. Backfilling needs to be placed simultaneously on each side of the box culvert. Don't exceed a 2-foot difference in elevation between sides of the culvert during placement of the backfill. Don't allow the wheels of rollers to come closer than one foot to the face of the structure during the compaction of the backfill. Make sure to review your plans for the structure backfill. This can vary from design to design. Typically, on the inlet side of the structure, there will be 2A or flowable backfill in front of the tow wall, around the wings, and the first 10 foot of the box culvert to help prevent water from going around the box culvert. When cover or fill is indicated on the plans, do not traverse the top of the box culvert with construction equipment until after the cover or fill has been placed, unless the cover exceeds 5 feet. Don't use vibratory rollers directly adjacent to or over top of the box culvert. Once all of the structure backfill is completed, a Class 2 Type B geotextile blanket is to be placed over the entire top of the backfill prior to placing any subbase material for the roadway. Once the box culvert is backfilled, only a couple more items need to be addressed to complete the installation. DEP requires most box culverts to have the inside backfilled with stockpiled natural streambed material. 
the material will be placed on the inside of the box culvert to the top of the baffles. This is to restore the existing stream to a natural condition. If guide rail is required over the box culvert, make sure to follow your plan. Depending on the depth of fill over the structure, different guide rail installations are required. For fill heights greater than 24 inches at post locations, type 31 strong post guide rail will be installed as shown on the standard drawings. For fill heights 24 inches or less at post locations, structure mounted guide rail is required. In either case, ensure the guide rail installation over the box culvert does not cause any damage to the box culvert. Following the steps covered in this video will help to ensure the construction and installation of a quality box culvert that is properly aligned at the correct grade, has tight fitting watertight joints, and will last a lifetime with minimal future maintenance expenditures. Special thanks to A.C. Miller Concrete Products, Swank Construction Company, Clearwater Construction, Glenn O. Hallbaker Incorporated, New Enterprise Stone and Lime Company, Power and Construction Group Incorporated, Todd Martin, Lance Eckenrode, and Sean McFarland.